Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here to our Supreme Court preview. My name is Michael Froge, and I'm one of the 1L representatives for the Federalist Society chapter at Maurer. The Federalist Society is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It's founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. The society, society seeks to promote promote both an awareness of these principles and further its application through activities, debates, and discussions like we have here today. So today it is my privilege to introduce our distinguished panelists. Ilya Shapiro on the far left is the director of the Robert A. Le Levy Center of the Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Before joining Cato, he was a special assistant and advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues and practice at Patton Boggs and Cleary Gottlieb. Mr. Shapiro is the co-author of Religious Liberties for Corporations, Hobby Lobby, the Affordable Care Act, and the Constitution, and editor of 11 volumes of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He's contributed to a variety of academic, popular, and professional publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Washington Post, LA Times, USA Today, and National Review, to name a few. He's also provided commentary on various media outlets, is a legal consultant to CBS News, and once appeared on the Colbert Report. Mr. Shapiro has testified before Congress and state legislatures and has filed more than 300 amicus briefs before the Supreme Court. He lectures regularly on behalf of the FedSoc, was an inaugural Washington Fellow at the National Review Institute and a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. In addition, he has been an adjunct professor at the George Washington University Law School and University of Mississippi Law School. He's also the chairman of the Board of Advisors of the Mississippi Justice Institute, a barrister of the Edward Koch Appellate Anne of Court, and a member of the Virginia Advisory Committee and to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. In 2015, National Law Journal named him to its 40 under 40 list of rising stars. Before entering private practice, Mr. Shapiro clerked for Judge Jolly of the U.S. US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He holds an A.B., from Princeton University, a master's from the London School of Economics, and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Closest to me is Professor Ryan Scott, who joined the Maurer School of Law faculty in 2009. He teaches and writes on criminal law and procedure, federal courts and jurisdiction, and the separation of powers. Professor Scott has written extensively on criminal sentencing. He has also studied efforts to influence judges indirectly through the judicial appointments process, strategies for encouraging judicial retirements, and the semi-retirement of senior judges. After graduating from the University of Minnesota Law School, Professor Scott clerked for Judge McConnell on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. He then served as a Bristow Fellow in the Office of Solicitor General of the United States. Before joining the faculty at Maurer, he also worked two years as an associate in the Supreme Court and appellate practice at o o o Mel 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 Melvin E. Myers LLP in Washington, D.C. So with that, I would like to introduce and start the conversation off with Mr. Shapiro. Thanks. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me back. I think I was here just this past spring, so uh, either I did a good job then or we just can't convince anyone else to come to Bloomington. Either way, I'm happy to be here for your, uh, your, your dining accompaniment. Um, I want to set the stage before we get into uh, about a half dozen or so of the cases on the docket this term. The, the, the term has already started. We've already had the October sitting. Uh, but I want to set the stage with what happened last year, which was sort of the calm before the storm, or really the calm bef between two storms. One storm, the, the bruising partisan confirmation battle over Brett Kavanaugh, and then the second storm is this term leading into a uh, presidential election year. So Justice Kavanaugh replaced the predictably unpredictable Justice Anthony Kennedy, and so was poised to move the court to the right. But looks can be deceiving. In a few high-stakes cases, and especially on petition rejections and what we call the shadow docket, that is, emergency motions, other procedures, uh, not the cases that are accepted for full briefing and argument, uh, he showed a pragmatic, not wholly originalist or conservative jurisprudence. Notably, he was the swing vote to allow an antitrust lawsuit to proceed against Apple. And uh, Kavanaugh tried to keep a low and agreeable profile. He actually became the justice most often in the majority last term, 91% of the time, just beating out John Roberts. You know, we hear about 
the chief being in the middle of the court for the first time in over half a century. I, I think that's true. I think that'll be borne out over the long term. But, the, but this first year, uh, uh, technically, Kavanaugh was more in the majority. And he showed how different he was from his fellow Trump appointee, Neil Gorsuch, who's rapidly becoming a libertarian darling. In fact, Kavanaugh aligned as much with Justices Breyer and Kagan as he did with Kavanaugh about 70% of the time. So there could in future be a dominant conservative bloc, uh, especially if uh, President Trump gets to fill any more seats. But for all the doomsday prophecies from progressive court watchers, that wasn't this year. Uh, of the 25 to 4 decisions, eight of them featured one of the conservatives moving over to join the four liberals uh, to make that majority. Four of those were Gorsuch, typically in criminal procedure cases. Uh, and again, of those 25 to 4, only seven had uh, an expected so-called uh, or conventional ideological split of five conservatives over four liberals. In a more typical term, and I think this term is going to be a more typical term uh, with more high-profile cases with ideological salience, we might see the conservatives flex their muscles, but that was not this past year. The term had 66 uh, rulings after argument, which is pretty low, but actually uh, a few higher than the last uh, previous years. And we're seeing stark doctrinal difference as much among the conservatives as between them and the liberals. In fact, fewer than 40 percent of the cases were unanimous. That's low. You know, you might get from just reading the papers, uh, you might think that, uh, well, every case is like five to four in some way. Well, that's not the case. I mean, generally in the last 20 years or so, just under half or so of the cases tend to be unanimous. And so last term, 39 percent, that's the lowest in more than a decade. Uh, the court reversed or vacated just under three quarters of the cases it took up. So just getting the court to hear your case is more than half the battle if you're the petitioner. The Ninth Circuit uh, was reversed the most, to maintain its crown as the, the biggest loser, attaining a 2 and 12 record, 86 percent reversal. Now, which justices were in the majority? I, I mentioned that Kavanaugh was first, then Roberts narrowly behind followed by Alito and Kagan at 82% in the majority. Nobody else broke 80, which is unusual. But then the floor was very high as well. There was a four-way tie among Thomas, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Gorsuch, who were each in the majority 70% of the time. So a high floor, no big losers among the justices. Again, unusual uh, adds to, to kind of the unusual nature of the term. Gorsuch, notably, was in the majority the most in the five to four cases, 14 of those 20. In terms of justices agreeing with each other, not surprisingly, Roberts and Kavanaugh were most in agreement in all but four cases. Um, then uh, Ginsburg and Sotomayor, then Alito and Kavanaugh, the rest of the pairings were below 90 percent. Notably, Sotomayor and Kagan agreed uh, with each other in all of the five to four cases. You don't typically think of Sotomayor and Ginsburg on the left, Kagan and Breyer somewhere more you know, moderate left, but in the five to four at least, that's what happened. And I said that Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, or that, uh, that Kavanaugh didn't agree with uh, Gorsuch as much as one could expect. In fact, they voted together the least frequently of any two justices in their first terms together appointed by the same president since at least JFK. I just haven't run the stats since before then, but it's, uh, it's pretty uh, remarkable. And uh, some whimsical final statistics for you. It's been now uh, three and a half years since Justice Scalia passed. Uh, he, uh, when he joined the court, uh, he really changed its tenor. It became a, a hotter bench. You know, lots and lots of questions. You, counsel can, can't even get a sentence out before the next question comes. Well, with his departure, are we going to quiet down a little bit? Uh, well, we've now had three years of experience, and the answer is no. All of the justices have uh, stepped up to fill the void. Uh, Justice Sotomayor has solidified her title as the most frequent interlocutor, 24 questions per argument, and she asks the most in nearly half the cases. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are about in the middle uh, with 15 questions a case. Justice Ginsburg, in interestingly, um, maintained her run as the first questioner. I don't know if the others defer to her in some way, but she asked them the first question in more than 40 percent of the cases. Even Justice Thomas got into the act this term. He asked three questions in a case called Flowers versus Mississippi involving uh, racial discrimination in jury selection, and that raised his average to one question every three years. <laughs> All right. So that's what we had this last term. A couple of big cases you might have heard of. You might have had a Supreme Court review already, but I think Gundy and Kaiser, the pushback on the administrative state, are going to be known as the, the biggest cases of the year, overshadowing the, the, the last day when we heard the, had the, hence the census case and the uh, partisan gerrymandering, which 
uh, were interesting but did not change the status quo at all. Now, this term, I'm going to take the lead on uh, three cases. Uh, Professor Scott's going to take the lead on a couple, and then, we, and then we're going to both uh, uh, discuss one uh, a CERT grant that just happened this past Friday that I had a, a piece in National Review uh, yesterday on uh, a separate, important separation of powers case. So the first case I want to discuss is New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus City of New York. This is the first Second Amendment case that the court has taken in over a decade. So District of Columbia versus Heller. Uh, 2008, the court declares that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms and strikes down an absolute ban that D.C. had inside the home. Two years later, it extended that ruling to the states through a process called incorporation. And that's a long and complicated uh, uh, issue. I've, I've written on how incorporation is actually a constitutional malapropism because if the framers of the 14th Amendment had wanted to simply say, you know, these amendments are now incorporated against the states or applied to the states, they could have said as much. They had the words in the English language. They did something different. But regardless, historical for various historical reasons, we have incorporation in that way. Uh, and But since that, since that 2010 ruling, uh, which was a 14th Amendment ruling after all, not fleshing out the scope of the right to arms, uh, the court has not taken up any case. Uh, and so lower courts are all over the place, not just in what kinds of restrictions and regulations uh, satisfy or pass muster under the Second Amendment, but which, uh, how to evaluate them, which standards to apply, whether it's scrutiny levels, whether it's, um, you know, how much history to look at, you know, all these different things all over the place. Uh, and so um, scholars and uh, advocates have been calling on the court to just take any case and start just, you know, telling lower courts what to do. I wrote an op-ed the first week of January in the Wall Street Journal uh, imploring the court to I mentioned a few cases, didn't mention this one actually. Uh, three weeks later, they granted cert uh, in this one. So now my rates for writing op-eds in support of people's uh, cert petitions have gone up. But anyway, uh, a, quir a quirky thing about this case is that it involves a New York City rule that no longer exists. So uh, New York City had a rule that uh, you could not transport your firearms outside city limits. It's kind of funny. It's, we, we, we don't like guns so much, you have to leave your guns in the city. Kind of odd. Uh, but anyway, um, posed a problem if you want to go to a shooting competition or a gun range or own a second home or, heck, if you're moving out of New York, uh, I guess you can't, uh, you can't take your, your firearms. And this is uh, licensed, locked, unloaded, you know, no problem with that sort of thing. Um, New York City defended its, its, its rule and won through the Second Circuit on appeal, but then the Supreme Court took the case, and all of a sudden, uh, a lot of the gun control community didn't want the Supreme Court in its current composition uh, taking up the issue, and so New York uh, repealed its rule, and the New York State Legislature passed a law saying no municipality can have such a rule, such a travel uh, restriction. Um, there were letter briefs over the summer um, uh, about whether that made the case moot. The Supreme Court ultimately scheduled it for argument. It's going to be argued in December. Uh, rolling in the mutinous question into the Second Amendment uh, uh, merits, as well as the right to travel, Commerce Clause. There are several exit ramps if John Roberts decides that he doesn't want to quite start ruling on the Second Amendment yet. There are other uh, exit ramps available, but then there are other Second Amendment cases coming up behind it. There's a, presumably a reason why the court took this case once Kavanaugh joined the court. Uh, you know, there's no more uncertainty from what Kennedy would do, or, or who knows, but uh, that's... Um, that has the potential uh, to um, to be an important case, and it also has the potential to fizzle. Do you want to say anything on that? Um, the mootness question in that case, I think, is a really interesting one. So uh, the, this is totally strategic, right? The, the legislature uh, sees that the Supreme Court has granted review, worries that it's going to lose, and so hastily repeals the law to try to avoid a constitutional decision. I think the Supreme Court will be uh, very unlikely to allow that tactic to work. And there's a longstanding mootness exception for voluntary cessation of conduct. You can't uh, just stop doing whatever is illegal as soon as you get sued and thereby moot the case because you could start doing it again as soon as the case is dismissed. And that's exactly the worry here, that as soon as uh, if, the, if the Supreme Court were to dismiss the case and vacate all the lower court opinions because of the change in the law, that uh, next year the uh, New York Assembly could change the law again. So I don't think that bid for mootness is going to work. And I certainly hope it does it, not only for that, partic that particular constitutional challenge, but uh, because in general I think it gives uh, incentives to legislatures that are uh, to, to mischievously pull back bills as soon as they get uh, subject to a serious credible constitutional attack. That does, that's not good for anybody's rights. 
Next case I want to talk about involves DACA, a bit controversial immigration case of the term, although the, uh, another one was recently added as well. Called So this one is uh, Department of Homeland Security versus Regents of the University of California, along with two others that were consolidated with it. Uh, Cato actually got some notoriety for the brief that, that we filed, which on, on the face, literally on the cover, says... Uh, in support of DACA as a matter of policy, but petitioners, meaning the government, as a matter of law. Let me explain. Uh, In 2012, after saying more than a dozen times that he was a president and not a king and could not change immigration law, could not give lawful status to people who were brought here illegally as children or any other class of uh, sympathetic uh, uh, illegal uh, immigrants, Uh, President Obama reversed course and put into place deferred action for childhood arrivals. Now, this went beyond merely setting priorities that, you know, we'll go after uh, violent criminals and human traffickers and that sort of thing uh, before we go after people who have violated no law other than crossing the border without permission. Um, Same sort of thing, prosecutorial discretion, like uh, go after murderers at a higher priority than than jaywalkers, that that, that sort of thing. Nobody um, has a problem with that, but... Uh, What President Obama did was say, if you satisfy certain basic requirements, you haven't committed a crime, you're, you know, uh, various, uh, pay a certain fee, uh, then you get a a temporary lawful status, and with that come certain benefits, eligibility for student loans, being able to work, um, various uh, attendant things that people with that kind of temporary lawful status uh, get. Uh, At the time, there were no lawsuits over that. Everyone was consumed with Obamacare. There was a presidential election. Uh, Obama was reelected, and soon thereafter passed uh, DAPA, which gave the same kind of uh, status and benefits to parents of uh, U.S. citizens and green card holders. DAPA was eventually enjoined by the Fifth Circuit and then uh, by an equally divided four to four Supreme Court when uh, Scalia died, uh, and President Trump eventually uh, rescinded uh, DAPA. And a little while later, he also went to rescind DACA. When he went to do that, he said, Look, DACA is very similar to DAPA. The courts enjoined that. I think uh, this is illegal. I think President Obama, the president, does not have authority to provide this type of lawful status, this documentation, these attendant benefits, uh, and therefore I'm rescinding it on that basis. Uh, The lower courts, several lower courts, as I said, three consolidated uh, cases, said, um, well, look, um, you are the president. Uh, President Obama had an, this was an executive action. You probably could have rescinded the executive action because you didn't like the policy. Maybe. There are other considerations, reliance interests and other things that we might want to look at, but you know, you would have been on firmer ground. But because you said that you're rescinding it because the law told you you have to effectively, you you consider this beyond presidential authority, well, then we get to evaluate it from the beginning. And, uh, you know, we don't agree that it's necessarily illegal. Uh, And therefore, uh, uh, the lower courts enjoined the rescission uh, of, uh, of DACA. Um, competing arguments on this. Uh, Does the government even have to provide a reason? Uh, Do courts get to evaluate what that reason is? If, if again, it's just prosecutorial discretion, executive action, not creating new law. On the other hand, if there's an element of creating new law that President Obama uh, went through uh, that requires some sort of more formal rulemaking to rescind or something like that, well, that would be unusual, and that would then, you know, bring us back to the, whether that was illegal in the first place. And uh, kind of a tertiary point that, that, that I made in my brief, um, that really raises issues of non-delegation. This Gundy case last term talked about how Congress can't uh, delegate the legislative power to anyone, including the executive branch. Well, if the immigration laws themselves were drawn so broadly as to give the president uh, power to, you know, write who can give status who, and, and what benefits and all of this, then there's really a delegation problem. And court, you should, uh, in the interest of avoiding ruling on this controversial, big constitutional issue, just defer to the executive's judgment that it's. Uh, that it's unlawful and and save the larger uh, issue for another day. We'll see what happens. I think chances are the court is going to say in some manner that uh, when you have when you live by executive action, you die by executive action. What Obama can do with a pen and a phone, Trump can do with a pen and a phone and a Twitter account. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, I got nothing to add on that. Okay. 
Um, the third case that I'm going to take the lead on is the big uh, religion clause case slash school choice education law and policy case called Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. Um, Montana, like uh, many states these days, have uh, uh, a tax credit scholarship program. That is, any state taxpayers can donate to this to a scholarship organization. There are many scholarship organizations. Uh, and then take a credit off their state taxes for uh, their donation. And then those scholarship organizations solicit applications from students and their parents, K-12 students and their parents, uh, for these scholarships, which they can then, which the students and their parents can then choose to use at a variety of schools, be they secular, religious, Montessori, you know, all these different kinds of structures of, of, of independent, uh, non, uh, non-governmental schools. Um, well, uh, a number of states, including Montana, have what's called a Blaine Amendment. These are state constitutional provisions that were added typically in the late 19th century at a time of anti-Catholic bigotry uh, to kind of raise the bar on the uh, U.S. Constitution's Establishment Clause. That is, uh, the, the wording is typically that, that you cannot have public support, direct or indirect, of religious institutions. At the time, it was aimed at Catholic schools, but it's been interpreted in lots of different ways. And some of these tax credit programs, or before them voucher programs, uh, got ensnared in these state Blaine amendments. Here, the Montana Department of Revenue said, not so fast. We are carving out from eligibility uh, any scholarship organization, or rather any uh, beneficiary, any beneficiary school of these scholarships that is uh, religious, that's parochial. Uh, the Montana Supreme Court, on, on reviewing this, did a curious thing. It said, look, uh, Montana Department of Revenue, you don't have the authority to make these kind of carve-outs and these decisions. Uh, there's no severability clause in the tax credit program. We're going to have to strike down the entire program. So state legislature, if you want to craft something new, then you know, go ahead. But we, uh, you know, we, have to, we have to strike this thing down. At which point, uh, uh, Mrs. Espinoza, who has a couple of school-age kids and wants to take advantage of the program, took her case to the Supreme Court, uh, arguing that uh, religious schools are being treated differently than non-religious schools, raising both an equal protection and a free exercise uh, violation, potentially establishment clause. Uh, And this builds on potentially uh, a few different cases. There's one from, I think, two or three years ago from Missouri about a church uh, that uh, was otherwise eligible and qualified for a state um, uh, playground resurfacing program. They were recycling old tires into playgrounds, and the church was disqualified simply because it was a church. The Supreme Court struck that down, saying, look, this is not building pews, this is not funding you know, Bibles, or this is a playground, and you can't discriminate based on religion for that purpose. Uh, Also, there was a case, uh, I think in 2012, called Arizona Christian School Tuition Organization versus Wynn, where Arizona, which is a state that does not have a Blaine Amendment, uh, had a similar type of tax credit program, and uh, the Supreme Court beat back challenges to it on standing grounds, frankly, on the idea that uh, state funds aren't actually going uh, to support these religious uh, schools in the first place because there's uh, so many decision points uh, that attenuate anything the state is doing or anything taxpayer funds are doing from uh, the support of the religious schools. Uh, And then there's another case, uh, Locke v. Davey from 2007, I believe, where the Supreme Court said, look, you can have a general state scholarship fund but uh, decline to support devotional education. That is, someone who wants to become Uh, a member of the clergy, a priest, a rabbi, that sort of thing. That is fine, because that is directly funding, you know, religious education. Uh, That's a very different thing than providing these scholarships uh, or, uh, you know, carving out a a church from eligibility from an otherwise secular program, that sort of thing. So um, if the conventional wisdom holds, uh, I agree with this, I filed a brief in support of Mrs. Espinoza and the uh, Supreme Court overturns the Montana Supreme Court, resurrects uh, this state program, then that would eliminate the last legal barrier to school choice programs uh, across the country. Then it becomes a purely political issue. That's it. All right. 
Well, I've got uh, two criminal cases to talk about, and they're uh, two crim cases that were argued on the first day of the term, uh, back to back. Uh, and I, if I could generalize, uh, the cases that uh, Ilya just talked about are all cases where conservatives constitutionally are sort of on offense. There are claims of constitutional right that would invalidate rules that are uh, passed by progressives. Uh, here it's the opposite. Conservatives are on defense in the two criminal cases in the sense that uh, both of these are claims by criminal de uh, defendants. If the a predictable uh, conservative split were to hold, you'd expect both of these petitioners to lose. One of them, I think the petitioner is definitely going to win, and the other is really close and interesting. Uh, so the first is uh, Ramos versus Louisiana, uh, which is a, a, a criminal procedure case. Uh, Ramos was uh, convicted of murder in Louisiana by a vote of 10 to 12. The jury voted 10 to 12. Two. To oh, sorry, 10 to 2. So, yes, 10 out of 12. Uh, Thank you. Ten to ten uh, to two, and if that sounds unusual, that you'd have a, a jury that voted by something other than a unanimous verdict, it is unusual. The traditional rule is that every jury verdict has to be unanimous. If uh, juries could vote to convict while there are still one or two people on the jury that are unconvinced, Twelve Angry Men would have been a very short movie. Uh, but two states, uh, Louisiana and Oregon, have for over a century allowed non-unanimous verdicts in criminal cases. Uh, the idea is to reduce the risk of a hung jury. A hung juries are costly. If the jury can't come to a unanimous verdict and you have to start everything over again, that's costly. Uh, as Justice Kavanaugh pointed out, another reason that non-unanimous jury rules have sometimes been uh, defended is that they uh, allow uh, minority voters to be, uh, jurors to be outvoted, right? If you've got one or two black jurors, all the white people on the jury can vote and uh, overrule them. That's one way that they were initially defended, uh, lamentably. Uh, in uh, Apodaca versus uh, Oregon, 50 years ago, the court considered whether the Sixth Amendment permits uh, a non-unanimous jury verdict. Does the right to a jury trial mean that the jury verdict has to be unanimous? That was the traditional common law rule. Is that what the, the Constitution requires? Uh, and the court held that the Sixth Amendment guarantees a right to a unanimous verdict. Uh, and the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial is incorporated against the states. But states don't have to have unanimous jury verdicts. They are allowed to have non-unanimous jury verdicts. If that sounds like a strange holding, it is. The court doesn't do that anymore. The court uh, uh, really never got into the business of distinguishing between what, how rights apply if they're incorporated against the states in the, in the name of due process. Uh, and it's the product of a very strange split on the court. In Apodaca 50 years ago, four justices thought the Sixth Amendment doesn't require unanimity. Four justices thought it does, and it applies with full force to the states. And so Justice Powell in the middle uh, got to decide the entire case. His was the deciding vote, and he had the squirrely view, rejected by eight out of nine justices on the court, that the rules should, the, should apply one way to the federal government and a different way to the states. Uh, it's a strange rule, but it's also been well settled for a long time. Uh, only two states have taken advantage of this option of using non-unanimous jury verdicts. Uh, it's uh, been uh, so, so this. And Louisiana since got rid of theirs. Yeah, this by, is like the last conviction. Moment. Yeah, by uh, by law, uh, Louisiana has uh, eliminated non-unanimous verdicts. So it's only Oregon now. Uh, but this case is still pending. This was one of the last cases that was decided using a non-unanimous verdict. Uh, and uh, the court has granted cert to reconsider Apodaca and uh, decide whether to overrule that decision, require a unanimous verdicts. Uh, let me boldly predict the Supreme Court is definitely going to overrule Apodaca and reinstate a requirement of unanimity, not just at the federal level, but at the state level as well. This was always a strange rule. Just last term in Timms versus Indiana, a state that uh, uh, one of our adjunct faculty members here, Tom Fisher, uh, argued, uh, uh, in that case, the, the court unanimously reaffirmed that well, we don't apply rights differently against the states than they do against the federal government if they're incorporated. If the excessive uh, fines clause is incorporated against Indiana, it means exactly the same thing that it does uh, against the federal government. Uh, so I don't think there's any appetite to defend the uh, holding of Apodaca itself. Indeed, the state doesn't even defend Apodaca. The state says uh, we should overrule Apodaca, but the other part of Apodaca, the part that uh, agreed that the Sixth Amendment uh, guarantees a right, a right to a unanimous jury verdict. Uh, I, based on the oral argument, I don't think there's any chance that uh, the, uh, the state is going to prevail on this one. I think there's a, uh, uh, this is – they didn't grant cert in this case to reaffirm uh, Apodaca and leave nothing intact. They, uh, the fact that they granted uh, cert in this case is a very strong signal that they're ready to overrule it. Uh, in fact, I think the most exciting thing will be to read the justices' opinions for what they say about stare decisis because like every case in which the court overrules one of its precedents, they're 
really talking about abortion. That's what all the opinions are secretly about, and they're all tiptoeing around saying anything that would get them in trouble later should an abortion case come, and they want to uh, be seen as consistent with everything that they've said before. So that's Ramos, uh, an, an interesting case that only affects a small number of, uh, of uh, convictions in a, a couple of states. Say a couple but, of things about yeah, that. Yeah, of course. So first, um, I haven't done the research on this. In Tim's, it's quite clear that excessive fines protections, you know, date back to colonial times, date back to the common law in England. So really deeply rooted in, in history and tradition as the Glucksburg standard for uh, applying uh, rights to the states for incorporation uh, 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 holds. I'm not sure, uh, maybe you know, is, is this similarly, uh, you know, were unanimous jury from the you know, institution of criminal, you know, lay juries, uh, was there a similar, you know, tradition of that? It certainly was all through the founding. Okay. Uh, you know, Louisiana started 100 years ago, so like, right. you know, late 19th right. century. Um, that kind of history matters, too. Yeah. Uh, the, the older the rule is, uh, the, the stronger it is. But uh, it's certainly a departure from the founding era and, uh, and older. Uh, that said, it's, it's reading Apodaca and uh, uh, the cases about the size of a jury, the method that the court uses today to evaluate due process and incorporation claims is just vastly different than the one it was using 50 years ago. A lot of discussion about unanimity is whether it's a good idea. Is, does unanimity help jurors make better decisions or not? The, the briefing today is all about history. It's much more about uh, uh, whether this is the kind of rule that enjoys uh, broad, uh, consistent historical support. I think there's, there's been a, a, sh a sea shift in the way the court thinks about these constitutional questions. Uh, the, the state actually says, well, yes, okay, the history is against us on this unanimity thing, but it's against us on the size of the jury, too. And you said we could have smaller juries right. than 12 people. So th th that's the kind of, that's the level of the debate that we're at uh, when it comes to uh, history and how it relates to the Sixth Amendment. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, you said at the very end that, you know, why would they take this case if not to overrule Apodaca? There's no circuit split, that sort of thing. Well, that's what people were thinking last term in the other big criminal case, Gamble, uh, regarding the uh, separate sovereign's exception to the... Uh, or doctrine uh, regarding the double jeopardy clause. There were no circuit splits, and somebody was prosecuted for, quote unquote, the same offense under both federal and state law. Uh, why would they take up the case if not to reverse or cabin somehow in light of the explosion of the federal criminal code and the overlap between federal and state criminal law, uh, if not to you know, change that in some way? And yet, lo and behold, seven to two, they affirmed the conviction uh, and, and the doctrine. So strange things can happen. Indeed. Uh, okay, the other criminal case that got argued at the first day of the new term uh, is a closer and it's a more interesting case. Uh, the question in the case is whether the Eighth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment permit states to abolish the insanity defense. You may remember from your first year criminal law class, uh, especially if you were in mine, uh, that states uh, take a wide variety of approaches to the, the insanity defense. Uh, the, most of them are built on the McNaughton test. This is an 1843 decision, uh, an English decision, uh, that uh, allows an insanity defense uh, when a, a person, because of mental disease or defect, uh, is uh, incapable of understanding what he was doing, in incapable of understanding the, the nature of his conduct or incapable of distinguishing right from wrong, incapable of knowing that uh, his conduct was wrongful. Uh, some states add an additional kind of uh, defense for a volitional incapacity. This is the so-called irresistible impulse test. Some states have adopted the model penal code variations on uh, versions of those tests that fo uh, focus on a defendant's substantial capacity. One state still bravely clings to the product test. Just look for a causal relationship between mental illness and uh, the crime. Thanks, New Hampshire. Uh, the mental illness, uh, and then four states, including Kansas, have abolished the defense altogether. There is no affirmative defense called insanity in Kansas. Mental illness evidence is still admissible, but it only goes to criminal intent, to mens rea. It's admissible to show uh, that the defendant didn't know what or intend whatever it is that the defendant had to know or intend as a precondition for uh, criminal responsibility, uh, but it's not a freestanding defense of any kind. Uh, so the petitioner is uh, James uh, Kaler. He was allowed to introduce mental illness evidence on the question whether he intended to kill. But he very clearly intended to kill. He uh, killed his wife and his mother-in-law and his two, two teenage daughters. He was uh, angry and depressed because she had an affair. But there wasn't any question that he knew what he was doing and he intended to kill. So he, what he wasn't allowed to do was bring in mental health experts to claim that he was incapable of sho uh, showing right from wrong or couldn't control himself, the kind of uh, insanity defenses that would be available in other states. Uh, 
it's another due process claim, a Glucksberg style claim, the, the, uh, and it's a heavy burden for a challenger to establish this kind of history, uh, a deeply rooted history. That's the sort of uh, uh, claim that due process would protect. Uh, and the court has rejected a similar kind of claim before. In Clark versus Arizona in 2006, uh, the court considered a due process challenge to Arizona's insanity defense. Arizona once had the, the two parts of the McNaughton formula, uh, cognitive and uh, moral uh, incapacity, uh, and it eliminated the first prong. It said, we're just going to have moral uh, incapacity, no cognitive incapacity. And the petitioner in Clark said, uh, that violates due process. Due process requires the full McNaughton, uh, all, both parts. Uh, and a majority of six justices... That sounds like a movie, the full McNaughton. Yeah. Uh, in, in a majority of uh, the, the court, uh, six justices, an opinion by Justice Souter, and no justices dissented on this point. So uh, to the extent anybody reached it, it was unanimous. Uh, said due process doesn't prohibit states from... Uh, pairing back on McNaughton to just the second part of that formula. And a lot of the language of, in Clark is going to be helpful to the state of Kansas as it defends its decision to uh, eliminate the defense altogether. Uh, it stressed that defining crimes, defining the elements of crimes, defining the scope of defenses to criminal liability, those are traditional state responsibilities. The Constitution doesn't have uh, much, if anything, to say about them. Uh, it's, uh, and that's especially true for something like insanity, which is a very complex set of moral uh, uh, medical, criminological questions. Insanity is an especially uh, tricky area, the, the kind of area where the Constitution seems like the least attractive uh, a way to, uh, uh, to regulate. Uh, Justice Kagan, at oral argument, asked a question of the, uh, the petitioner's counsel, saying, uh, I understand that you say this is a historical requirement that insanity take this form, but aren't there lots of historical defenses to liability that we don't respect anymore? Things like the marital rape exception, things like uh, burglary having to be committed at night in a dwelling. We've uh, abandoned a whole lot of elements of crimes and defenses over the years. Why should this be the one that due process uh, guarantees forever and the others we're free to abandon when we think they're no longer a good idea? Uh, I'm not sure how serious she was about that question. I think she can probably find a way to, uh, uh, to distinguish those uh, kinds of elements, but, uh, but it gives you a sense of the difficulty. And that background, the idea that states uh, have a lot of flexibility in this area, is certainly helpful. Uh, that said, the claim here is a lot stronger than the claim in Clark, because what the Clark petitioner was asking for is this, ex this precise two-part formula adopted in 1843 is uh, protected by due process. That's a heavy lift because it didn't come along that, uh, until McNaughton. It had never been formulated that way. Uh, lots of states have taken different uh, approaches to insanity uh, over the years. Uh, to say from this uh, variety of approaches that states have taken that this is the one and only one way to phrase your insanity test, that's a heavy lift when it comes to uh, due process. Saying there's no insanity defense, though, that's a much harder uh, claim. There has been some kind of affirmative defense for insanity since long before McNaughton, stretching back to the common law. Again, the historical record isn't always precise and clear. Lots of different courts are phrasing it in different ways. Uh, I think the big challenge for the petitioners and their lawyers in this case was how to articulate a, a coherent and uh, historically defensible Minimum. What's the guaranteed constitutional minimum? If, if there is a guaranteed due process insanity defense, what does it look like? And the formula they've come up with is uh, essentially uh, the McNaughton Part 2 test, uh, the capacity to distinguish right from wrong. If a person is unable, because of mental disease or defect, to understand that what they were doing is wrong, uh, then due process protects a defense in that, that it's unconstitutional uh, for a state to punish them. Uh, and there's a related Eighth Amendment claim that uh, under the Eighth Amendment uh, rule that a, a, a punishment that serves no purpose, uh, that, that serves no retributive or deterrent purpose, uh, is uh, unjustified, is a violation of the Eighth Amendment, uh, that uh, likewise punishing someone who lacks the capacity to know that they were doing uh, right or wrong uh, is uh, unconstitutional. Uh, there's one other part of Clark that I think might play a, a role in this case. The other reason that Justice Souter said that uh, the Clark formulation passed muster is he kind of rewrote it, he kind of reformulated the way that it worked, uh, or, or more accurately, he accepted the state's uh, reformulation of how it worked. Uh, yes, the state eliminated the cognitive uh, prong of uh, uh, McNaughton, but if cognitive prong, if you lack the capacity to know what you're doing, 
that's evidence that you didn't know what you were doing is wrong, right? If you don't know what you're doing at all, how can it be said that you knew what you were doing was wrong? So it's not that they eliminated that prong altogether. It's really that they just channeled that evidence into a different kind of showing about moral incapacity. Uh, that same argument won't work in this case, but the state has taken the position, uh, although uh, it was advertised as a repeal of the uh, <coughs> insanity defense, an abolition of the insanity defense, quite self-consciously after uh, cases like uh, uh, the attempted assassination of Don, uh, Ronald Reagan that uh, got, resulted in a not guilty by uh, reason of insanity verdict, it was advertised as an abolition. Now the state says, we didn't really abolish the insanity defense or uh, make this kind of evidence uh, irrelevant. You can still introduce mental illness evidence. You can still introduce evidence that you didn't know right from wrong to the extent that it implicates uh, mens rea, to so the extent that it implicates a guilty mind. And what's so fascinating about that, I part, I, I'm partly attracted to that argument because at one point in the common law era, you may remember if you were in my first year criminal law class, uh, a general intent and specific intent, these are uh, ways of phrasing a more general requirement of a guilty mind, of culpability. Before McNaughton and this articulation of a two-part uh, insanity uh, defense, uh, the common law way of getting to questions of insanity often did have to do with mens rea. It was folded into the, uh, the culpability question, the ultimate question about whether the defendant had a guilty mind. Uh, so it's not totally implausible, but it is a, a, a reversal or reformulation of the way that the state had traditionally characterized what it was doing. Um, I, I mention that because a couple of justices, Justice uh, Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh at oral argument both talked about this. One of them uh, actively disagreed with the characterization that the insanity defense had been abolished here. Uh, that might be another path by which the court uh, uh, backs out of saying that there is no, to, uh, or avoids the question whether uh, the Constitution requires uh, a, a, a minimum uh, insanity test just by saying uh, it has provided one here, so we don't have to uh, reach that uh, question. But I think this one will be at least be closer because the historical uh, evidence is a lot stronger here than it was in Clark uh, and in some, uh, some of these other cases that some kind of insanity defense uh, has traditionally been required. Well, I do want to leave time for questions, so I'll just mention real quickly the uh, cert grant uh, on Friday in a case called SALA Law versus Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The, um, the CFPB has been a long embattled uh, agency created under the Dodd-Frank uh, Reform Act in 2010, uh, and it's an unusual type of independent agency. Um, you know, there a lot of commentary uh, uh, about uh, the growth of the administrative state and especially agencies that are effectively the fourth, fifth, sixth branch of government not accountable to Congress or the executive. Um, this one uh, doesn't even get its budget from Congress. It gets it from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, the uh, makes the rules, uh, investigates them, enforces them, punishes, I mean, judge, jury, executioner, uh, constable, all wrapped into one uh, under a very broad animating directive to, um, you know, help out consumers. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a very broad operating charge. Uh, and um, the regulations it's promulgated have been pretty vague as well. So it's basically set itself up to target whomever it wants, kind of a, a, a bill of attainder type of, uh, of situation. And um, it's been controversial not just uh, among, you know, opponents of Elizabeth Warren, who uh, was the animating figure in creating the CFPB. She was ultimately too controversial to be appointed to be uh, its, its, its director. Um, uh, but um, constitutional scholars who have a problem with the structure, not just the kind of business or market-oriented aspects of the uh, uh, regulatory aspects of the agency, but the fact that it has this sole director who can't be removed other than for cause, meaning, you know, some sort of uh, you know, uh, malicious behavior or, you know, some, some, some really bad stuff, not just the president wants somebody different to pursue different policies or, or whatever else. Um, and uh, the term lasts, uh, I think it's a five-year term, so you know, across the, uh, the, the presidential election year and, and, and all that. It seems to facially violate the separation of powers, this kind of structure. And there have been several cases in recent years uh, where these kind of structural or appointments clause issues have come up with regard to 
uh, the structure of the, the public, accounting, uh, public Company Accounting Oversight Board created by the previous financial regulatory reform, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, or, uh, or the SEC itself and how, uh, how its commissioners are appointed and who they're responsible to, or, their, uh, or the uh, administrative law judges in the, in the SEC. So these kind of deep structural issues uh, are important because we, you know, structure matters. We want to have uh, accountability to the political system, not just kind of a, a freestanding you know, uh, uh, deus ex machina that, that's uh, not uh, provided for in the Constitution. So anyway, the, uh, the lower court here uh, ruled uh, for the CFPB. Sala Law uh, uh, wrote a petition that the Supreme Court granted. And this is in the context where other kind of similarly structured agencies are also under attack from similar separation of powers concerns. The federal uh, housing finance agency, FHFA, which is the parent organization of Fannie uh, Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, was held to be unconstitutional. The remedy was unusual by the en banc uh, Fifth Circuit Court. There are other cases coming up. So anyway, this uh, could be a blockbuster for uh, the way uh, different kinds of administrative agencies are are put together, and then there's a separate consideration of what the remedy is. Is everything that it's done now uh, wiped away? Can you uh, retroactively ratify? Um, and this is being taken up uh, also uh, while the court heard argument during the same week about the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, uh, similar appointments clause concerns over that uh, unique board that, that Congress established to deal with uh, debt restructuring uh, on the island. Is the Remedy question before the court is the cert grant. Yes. Uh, In fact, they grant? added the question. The, another, the court itself added another question presented about uh, is the, the, the is well, no, the, the retroactivity isn't before the court, but uh, severability is before the court. Right. So uh, the Fifth Circuit, when it was evaluating the FHFA, found the structure unconstitutional, but sort of the remedy was well, okay, you know, fix the structure and then re ratify your stuff. Um, and that there were different majorities in that 16 judge on Monk court uh, for those two rulings. Uh, so what, uh, just, I'm curious, I, I guess now that we're at the question and answer period, let me ask the first question. <laughs> um, on that route, I, I think the, the structure uh, question in, uh, in the CFPB case is, is likely to go against the government. Um, uh, that is to say, I think it's likely to be found uh, unconstitutional. Yeah, well, especially since the government and the CFPB itself now under new management right. is now <laughs> against itself, basically. Uh, but the remedy question seems like a formidable one. So uh, w what are the range of options that the court has here? I mean, I guess one is you could sever, you could strike down only those provisions that insulate the, the leadership of the CFPB from uh, control by the president uh, and Congress and uh, I guess the purse strings control of the Congress, right? Just excise those portions that insulated from political accountability. Which is what the court did in the Peekaboo case, Free Enterprise Fund. Peekaboo is Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. We have fun acronyms in DC. Uh, do you think that's the likely uh, probably. Uh, outcome? All right. Probably. Probably. Uh, and then what would that although, mean? Although, although Kavanaugh is a major player in this, he ruled in a similar case against the CFPB. Uh, on the D.C. Circuit panel, he voted to strike down the whole thing. Right, before the en banc Before the en banc D.C. Circuit overturned him, yeah. Uh, did he have anything to say about the remedy in that case, uh, just I, to give a sense of what he might think? I, I think he went full bore. Just, it's, the whole structure is whole unconstitutional? Structure, I think All so. of its acts were I lawless? Think, I think that's right. Okay. Well, that would be a much more dramatic uh, outcome. Uh, I, I, I imagine there'll be a lot of people on the court uncomfortable with that course of action. Yeah. But. Okay, we'll throw it open to you. Uh, questions about the upcoming term? Yeah. Sure. Uh, my, my argument is that if the legislature repeals a defense, isn't the legislature trampling into or unconstitutionally discharging an inherent judicial function, for I would say that the inherent merit or the strength of any defense put forward by a defendant is an essential judicial function. And the moment the legislature decides that this defense is un per se unavailable, what they are doing is discharging a judicial function which is constitutionally not perm permissible. 
So that argument's not before the court uh, in the Kaler case, and it's, it, that's not consistent with the usual uh, understanding of the legislative responsibility for defining crimes. Uh, it's true that uh, originally, uh, in, in the Anglo, uh, Anglo-American tradition, uh, judges developed common law crimes and common law defenses, just like they developed common law tort law and common law contract law. Uh, but that, uh, the fact that they originated with judges uh, doesn't alter the, le- the ultimate legislative responsibility for defining what is criminal and what is not. And that includes defining what is a defense to criminal liability and what is not. So I don't think there's a, a, a significant concern about the legislature's power to define what the scope of an insanity defense is. Uh, the constitutional question comes up if there's a, a problem with failing to recognize uh, a defense that is Im- implicit in the Eighth Amendment uh, or, or is required by due process for historical reasons, and uh, it's not impossible. The court has su- certainly suggested that there are some, uh, uh, that due process guarantees uh, some uh, historically rooted rights, uh, notwithstanding a legislature's decision that it should no longer be a defense, but it's, uh, it's at least a very narrow category. And we didn't mention the, uh, the abortion cases. That was the previous Friday cert grant, uh, the arguments over sexual orientation and gender identity and employment discrimination law. That was a series of cases that were argued a couple of weeks ago. Bridgegate, right, Chris Christie's uh, little scandal. It's a big term. We were going to talk about some of those, but we understand there was another recent upcoming term preview event that uh, already covered some of those. So we've tried to focus on those that hadn't come up at other events yet. Yes? So you talked about the fact that the court was rebringing up the case regarding the unanimous jury verdict. Yeah. Do you think that similar logic applies to them bringing up the abortion case? Do you think that they're bringing it up to make some alterations to their kind of past precedent on abortion, or do you think that it's being brought up as more of an affirmatory case, if you were to have to wander a guess? Abortion cases are unlike every other category of cases uh, in the Supreme Court. So I, I, I think I, I liked the comparison with Gamble last year. Uh, another, you know, a long-standing holding that the court had, uh, but but some uh, justices had expressed discomfort with. They granted cert after a couple of justices. Thomas even changed his mind. Right. He, he had written some opinions. Uh, uh, dissenting from the yeah. denial of cert, questioning the rule, but then uh, voted to reaffirm it when the case was before them. I, I think that the big difference between... Uh, then spent 20 pages saying, had he not changed his mind, sorry, decisis wouldn't have prevented him from yeah. overturning the it's rule. It's almost as if he had written that before. Yeah, right, still wanted right. to get the use out of the pages. Um, I, I do think one big difference is, uh, unlike Gamble, which uh, is, a, a, I guess, a controversial rule, but one that has a certain logic uh, and uh, is defensible. Nobody defends the rule of Apodaca. It's, it was a dumb rule from the very beginning, and uh, that kind of rule is especially unlikely to survive. Uh, it's, it's the kind of rule that the court is most likely to abandon in the name of stare decisis. Abortion is not like that. Uh, granting a, a case doesn't necessarily signal uh, automatic reversal uh, just because uh, the stakes are as high as they get and the, the, the nation's attention is uh, as focused as it gets on that. So I, I'm not sure we can necessarily read it. That's not to say they won't reverse, just I, I don't think that was uh, uh, we can read in the same uh, they, didn't, they didn't take this case to affirm kind of logic in that one. Any other questions? So first of all, go Nationals. <laughs> secondly, um, I'm actually going to game four on, on Saturday. Um, secondly, uh, you know, th- like I said, they didn't take the Second Amendment for a decade, probably because neither side was sure of what uh, Kennedy would do, and John Roberts wanted to minimize controversy, given that he has enough to deal with, I guess. Uh, with Kavanaugh on the court, they took the case. Uh, I, because Roberts could no longer avoid controversy or the other four forced his hands. Kavanaugh actually has a record of Second Amendment opinions on the D.C. Circuit. Fourteenth Amendment, he had nothing. So, you know, looking at him in these cases, that's like his first perspective on this stuff. But Second Amendment, he, uh, he actually was a, a strong defender of, and so they could have forced Roberts' hand. Um, you know, ultimately, it took them a while to schedule the case for argument. So they granted in January. They didn't put it on the argument calendar 
until very late, after like uh, October and November were already filled, even though this was one of the first grants for the term. Uh, and then they had the flurry of letter briefs, and then there's kind of like an afterthought. They said, no, it's not moot, but be prepared to talk about it. I think it's, you know, we'll see what happens at argument. We'll see uh, uh, if they grant another Second Amendment case in the meantime, then the chances of this one being dismissed as moot uh, increase, because if they really want to decide the Second Amendment issue, there are other vehicles. Um, at the same time, they took kind of the narrowest, weirdest gun restriction that they possibly could to be able to make new lawns, so maybe that's why they want it. And, and that's, I think the uh, challengers are likely to succeed in that one, but precisely because it's such a weird uh, restriction. Hard to defend, seems internally inconsistent. Uh, it's a, a, it's a, a hard law to defend, which is, I think, exactly why the legislature in New York was so eager to get rid of it. But, but the key isn't whether the particular restriction, which is very rare in the country, uh, will survive. Uh, as I said, it's kind of bizarre. We're so pro-gun control that you have to leave your guns here, right? It's kind of odd, right? Um, it's more about what kind of standards uh, the court is going to set for lower courts in other cases, because currently they're simply, you know, they're playing on an open field. I could see it being more than 5-4 on striking down the structure, but 5-4 on the remedy. I could see something like that happening, uh, you know, with there being, or, you know, weird coalition on the remedy or something like that. I could, I could see something like that happening. But given what they've done in these other structural cases in the last decade, and with Kavanaugh only strengthening the court's hand in terms of uh, allegiance to structure, constitutional structure, I, I can see, you know, uh, in that peekaboo case, Breyer was in the majority. In the recess appointments case, I think Breyer was in the majority uh, to, to strike down the recess appointments. So uh, there's a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I find it very hard to believe that the court uh, will not reverse there, but the, the remedy is where the, the whole game will be. All right. Um, everyone, can you give them a round of applause? Thank you, everyone, for, thank you, everyone, for showing up today.